Thank you for your patience with the paper in English. I appreciate it. The late Roque Cordero remains to this day the premier composer of art music from his native Panama. An emigre to the United States, he studied composition with Ernst Krenick, from whom he learned the procedures of 12-tone composition, a method he adopted for the majority of his career. He became known internationally for his trademark synthesis um, of the high modernist techniques with the rhythms of Latin dance. For those unfamiliar with Cordero, I will play a brief excerpt from a work in his trademark style, his 1990 Dodeca Concerto. A bit of from the first movement first. Side, are reminiscent of the respective works for chamber orchestra by Arnold Schoenberg and Alvin Baer, while his rhythmic language recalls styles from his home country. Cordero's work is often mentioned in both scholarly articles and journalistic reviews, but rarely has his music been the subject of serious analysis. Consequently, misperceptions of his music abound in the discourse surrounding his work especially in his adopted country, the United States. Namely, nearly every author who mentions him, even briefly, notes that he is a serial composer, but always with the qualification that his works are not strictly dodecaphonic. This trend likely began with Gilbert Chase's 1959 statement that Cordero, quote, employs serial technique freely rather than dogmatically. This perception has had a long half-life. In 1980, Aurelio de la Vega described his music as based on a loose utilization of 12-tone method. Similarly, in 1977, Tomasini called Cordero a composer who has absorbed the aesthetics, though not the strict procedures, of 12-tone composition. Mind you, there are no 12-tone aesthetics. I don't even know what that means, but OK. Um, and even today, authors continue to accept this assumption uncritically. Lavenville, as recently as 2011, fastens upon the freedom of his serial composition. After reading this near-identical description of Cordero's music again and again, I wondered how could so many authors present this information uh, without citing an example of a specific piece that illustrates how Cordero's music is serial, but not strictly so. Had anyone studied even one of his pieces to determine what was meant by his alleged free application of serial method? After analyzing many of Cordero's 12-tone works in detail, it has become clear to me that this off-sided claim about his music is only a partial truth and a misleading one at that. My purpose today is simple, to explain why this narrative is not wholly correct. I will demonstrate that emphasizing the freedom of his 12-tone compositions is unwarranted. Some of his works are in fact organized with the same serial rigor as the mature 12-tone compositions of Arnold Schoenberg. But even in the pieces where his procedures differ from Schoenberg substantially, his works are in fact closer to Schoenberg's practice than those of many other serial composers. Consequently, if we don't call their work free or loose, why should we do that for Cordero? Lastly, I will suggest why the casual assumptions about his work have gone unquestioned for as long as they have. 
and explore how this affects Cordero's reception today. I'll begin with a piece that demonstrates Cordero's application of serial method in a manner that is anything but free. Tres mensajes breves of 1966 for viola and piano. I'll play a brief sample of that. In this piece, every note can be accounted for with a single tone row, subject only to canonical operations of transposition, inversion, retrograding, or combinations of those. The serial structure is generally straightforward, easy to parse, even without the help of pre-compositional sketches. Comparison of the specific row forms that Cordero chose for this piece reveals an interest in at least three of the same abstract unifying features for which Schoenberg is known. First, he chooses only a limited number of row forms for this piece, six or ten if we count them both in retrograde and non-retrograde. Next, he begins and ends all movements with only those that begin or end on pitch class 9, those highlighted in yellow above. They begin or end all movements. <clears throat> um, lastly, each of, the six row, each of the six row forms used here all have what is called invariant segments when they are compared to at least one other form. That is to say, each has identical portions to another version which has the potential to create an audible motivic unity across row forms, and it does in this piece. See above that P9 and P3 have five identical segments, just in a different order. I8 and I5 are likewise characterized by common subsets, as are P11 and I9. Note also that the top two pairs have three invariant segments between all four of them. See that the notes 9 and 10 always appear together, as do 0, 1, and 2, as well as 7 and 8. Another piece that is conspicuously Schoenbergian is his uh, soliloquy number one for solo flute. Here, Cordero employs Schoenberg's trademark device of row construction, hexachordal inversional combinatoriality, a feature that appears in all of Schoenberg's late works. That is to say that the first half of one row form has the same content as the second half of another when you invert it. See above that the forms P6 and I3 have identical hexachords or six note segments, but they're related by inversion, not only, it's not just taking one hexachord and moving it. Um, and, uh, and, and like in Tres Menzajes Breves, uh, Cordero restricts the number of row forms uh, in the soliloquy substantially using only three out of 24 distinct versions. The two, pri the two prime forms used, P0 and P6, are unified by identical dyads, identical two-note groups, creating six motives that recur at precisely the same pitch class level throughout the piece. Contributing further to this unity, uh, the only other form used, P11, or pardon me, R11, has the same middle tetrachord, the same middle four notes as the other two prime forms used, creating both, oh, too far, sorry, okay. Um, creating both a, a sonic and an abstract parallelism rivaled only by the works of Milton Babbitt. That is, with one minor caveat. There seems to be one note in this piece that departs from the row. In the third movement, there is a C in place of a B flat, marked in red above. 
There may be a practical reason for this apparently deviant note, however. Uh, the B flat that appears closest to that C would be too low for a standard flute, be out of the range. So one might speculate that Cordero would, uh, simply made a, a minor change to the series to accommodate the instrument that was used. And further, as the instruction here, you might be able to see that it says clicking the keys. Uh, so the pitches do not sound precisely. So the fact that there is a C instead of a B flat has limited sonic relevance. And we can hear that. No, no. <laughs> I should add that's not a professional recording that's taken from, from YouTube, but we'll make what you will. Okay. Um, so as we can see, both Tres Mensajes Breves and Soliloquy No. 1 are clear examples of serial works that are not so freely constructed after all. Rather, at least so far as the well-tone technique is concerned, they might as well have been composed by Anton Weber. Nonetheless, the same cannot be said of all of his dodecaphonic works. His procedures do, at times, differ from Arnold Schoenberg. However, this should not be taken as evidence that his works are somehow loosely 12-tone. Rather, Cordero was following 12-tone method as he knew it. In fact, there is no reason to expect that Cordero would have been familiar with Schoenberg's serial practice at all. Joseph Strauss, in his 2009 monograph, Twelve-Tone Music in America, makes it clear that the theoretical foundations of Schoenberg's music were not widely understood in mid-century America, noting that there were few reliable sources of information about Schoenberg's procedures. What is more, in 1944, when Cordero first tried his hand at dodecaphonic music, Schoenberg's practice was still evolving, as the composer was still alive and well, yet to compose late-life masterpieces such as the String Trio and A Survivor from Warsaw. Rather, Strauss explains, quote, for many younger American composers, Krennic's descriptions of 12-tone music were the only ones that they knew. Their image of 12-tone music was the image that Krennic created. If this is so, then perhaps we should not use Schoenbergian serialism as the measure with which to evaluate Cordero's music. Krennic's version, transmitted both through his music and his prolific pedagogical writings, would seem a more sensible starting point. This would be so even if Cordero had no personal connection with Krennic whatsoever. But, Given that he learned of 12-tone music directly from the lesser-known Austrian, a reconsideration of Cordero's music in this light seems long overdue. We shall see that some features of his practice, which are most, most at odds with Schoenberg's procedures, are well in line with Krennic's. Two such characteristics of Cordero's music readily present themselves. First, Cordero liked to use segments of a row as an unordered set. That is to say, like a scale in tonal music. A scale is the raw material for tonal composition, but uh, tonal pieces don't just play scales in order. They play whichever notes from the scale they want. Cordero certainly learned, almost certainly learned this approach from Krennic, either in person or through one of the many articles that Krennic had published about his Lamentatio, a piece that was composed immediately before Cordero began his studies with Krennic. Cordero imitates this practice most clearly in his 1954 piano duo, in which he uses flexibly ordered five note sets as an ostinato. Another feature of Cordero's music that is alien to Schoenberg, but normal for Krennic, is his eagerness to repeat portions of a row. Cordero's very first lesson in 12-tone method was a reading of Krennic's 1940 text, Studies in Counterpoint, based on the 12-tone technique. In this text, Krennic suggests that notes within a series may be repeated, arguing that it would seem pedantic to set up rigid rules on the extent to which 
a composer might go in using repetition. Note this is a significant departure from Schoenberg. Not insignificant. Even in pieces such as Tres Mensajes that are otherwise Schoenbergian, Cordero took this allowance to heart, routinely retracing his steps, restating three or four or maybe five of the notes of, of the row in sequence, often multiple times. The same can be said of his violin concerto, as well as his five new preludes for piano, among many other pieces. Even though Krennick's Studies in Counterpoint was designed merely as a didactic introduction to serial practice, the lessons therein apparently stuck with Cordero throughout his career, and he continued to follow many of Krennick's helpful hints for decades to come. In addition to allowing repeated notes, Krennick suggests that a productive way to begin a piece for two instruments is to have one part state the prime form of the row, while the other states the inversion. Cordero begins several pieces exactly this way, in fact, almost a majority. Krennick similarly recommends closing a movement using the retrograde of the form with which the, music, with which the movement began. This also became a default procedure for Cordero. For example, all three movements of soliloquy number one are designed this way. Uh, and this is likewise true of soliloquy number two for saxophone, uh, the second movement of which begins with I1 and ends with RI1, the same row backwards. In highlighting Cordero's remarkable fidelity to some of Krennick's prescriptions, I do not mean to suggest that he was an uncritical student. This could not be further from the case, as Cordero flouts Krennick's rules about sonority, dissonance, and series design. Rather, I simply mean to demonstrate that Krennick's teachings are Cordero's point of departure, not Schoenberg's. Why, then, do so many still believe in the apparent freedom of his 12-tone method? One reason is the, per is the pervasive misbelief that any deviation from Schoenberg's methods somehow means that a composer's works are not properly 12 tone If they're not like Schoenberg, they're not right. Joseph Strauss calls this the myth of serial orthodoxy, which is a great name for an oddly tenacious fiction. No two composers approach 12 tone music in the same way, Drisk, next to his name, when he is mentioned as a serial composer. Yet, even as more scholars come to realize that 12-tone music is a diverse practice, characterized by virtually no standard procedures and no standard aesthetic goals, I fear that many will continue to accept the prevailing wisdom about his music, because, perhaps, of factors relating to Cordero's own identity. As a composer of Afro-Latin birth, he stands out from the European and Euro-North American crowd of serial composers, and it is all too easy to ascribe the apparent, though fictitious, difference of his composition to his own otherness. This is perhaps why so many insist that Cordero's 12-tone music is somehow loose, casual, or idiosyncratic. But we fail to say the same of his European and Creole peers like Igor Stravinsky, Aaron Copland, and, yes, even Alban Berg. And this is a lamentable double standard. In fairness, Cordero himself was wont to emphasize how his own music was different from his peers, and he always took care to reassure his audience that his music was in some way essentially Panamanian. And to be sure, the surface rhythms that recall the dances of his home country are a unique feature of his style, certainly worthy of scholarly attention. And of course, this is hardly the first instance where critics and scholars have stepped onto thin ice by arguing that features of an artist's work are somehow a reflection of their own personal identity. After all, some have ascribed, dubiously, Schoenberg's invention of serial practice to his own otherness as a Jewish composer in Austro-German society. But we do Cordero a great disservice when we focus only on the superficially Latin elements of his music, emphasizing how his work differs from that of his global northern peers, 
and glossing over the similarities. Of course, Cordero's difference may provide his music with exposure that it otherwise would not receive, but at worst, at least in North America, his work is performed almost exclusively on programs featuring other composers of color or composers from Latin America. Would it be so unreasonable to perform his music alongside that of Bartok, Debussy, Stravinsky, Baer? Regardless, as Cordero's centenary is approaching next year, it is my hope that his music will receive the consideration and reconsideration it deserves as his music is programmed for commemoration. Thank you.